Okay. <laughs> well, my uh, interest in World War I, World War II, Civil War, and everything else had uh, kind of got me into picking up pieces that were actually there. This is a piece I didn't pick up. My father-in-law brought this gun back from uh, the Second World War, and it's a French officer's revolver, 1874. 1874 is pretty outdated by the time of World War I, but you'd be amazed how many old weapons and old equipment was put into service during the war. This is a rather up-to-date revolver, actually. It can be either cocked and carefully aimed and fired, or as a double action, if you're in a hot spot, you can just keep pulling. That's the double action. I started out with a pistol because the war more or less started out with a fellow named Gavrilo Princip, uh, kind of an obscure guy, most people never heard of him, but uh, he was the catalyst of World War I. World War I was in the wings waiting to happen, and his killing of the Archduke of Austria kind of inspired Austria to declare war on uh, Bosnia, or uh, let's see, uh, what was it, all these little countries. At any rate, he was a, a Bosnian Serb, and Serbia was a piece of land that uh, Austria wanted to take over. So they used that as an excuse to make some demands for reparations for the killing of the Archduke. Well, Serbia couldn't meet the demands, which they didn't expect them to meet. And they got a little backing from Germany that pushed them over the edge. They waged war on Serbia, and Serbia kind of kicked their butt for a little while. So other people came into the war, and it just developed. Uh, there's all kinds of YouTube videos on the history of the war, if you want to go into the details. Today, we're just going to concern ourselves with some of the tools. Now, I mentioned earlier with the pistol that they used a lot of outdated weapons. And uh, this is an Italian Vetterli rifle. It was originally a single-shot black powder gun. It was developed about five years after the American Civil War ended. It's that primitive. They ended up figuring out that one shot at a time wasn't good, so they, add, they modified the gun. They added a magazine. Magazine, by the way, is the part that holds the gun. A magazine is part of the gun. It's not to be confused with a clip, although it is I'm confused quite often. The magazine would hold four rounds, okay? So now you're up to date with that, but you're still firing black powder. During World War I, they pressed them into service again for second-line troops, artillery people, people who weren't expected to need a gun would be armed with these old relics. And they modified it a second time by adding a magazine that took the more modern smokeless powder and what they called an end block clip. Now this, part that holds all those cartridges together is a clip. In this case, an end block clip goes into the gun and stays in the gun until you're done with the last cartridge. Then it falls out or it's kicked out like the M1 Garand, it actually throws the clip out the top. The other type of clip, more commonly used, is a stripper clip, holds these cartridges together. It's just a little piece of tin on the back. This could be used by putting it in the back of the gun and shoving all the bullets out of it, and then the clip is just thrown away. But the thing to remember is a clip is not part of the gun. The magazine is. Even in an automatic pistol, you can take the magazine out and put it back in, but it goes with the gun. It's part of the gun. So they modified some of these old guns quite extensively. Here's another version. This is an Italian. And this one was originally a three-shot. They thought they were into something with a three-shot, but then they found out that was lacking a little bit, so they added this little box on the bottom to the magazine. That gave them a five-shot gun. It was an end-block clip that would fall out of the gun when you were done shooting, and to keep the dirt out of it, they had a little, little trap door here, and when you were using it, when you were done, you shoved the next one in, it would supposedly shove the previous one out the bottom. 
another modified gun. You'll also notice that these guns are extremely long. During the war, they found out that uh, in a trench, it's not too good an idea, especially if you have a bayonet on it, you can't swing it around. So the Germans began work on what they called a short rifle. This is the 98AZ, developed into the K98, which you might be familiar with. That was the Second World War German gun, about the same length as this one, with slight modifications. When we went overseas, most of our guys, incidentally, we, uh, we only had about 14,000 troops over in the middle of 1917, but by 1918, we got as many as a million over there. Two-thirds of those troops were armed with this gun. This is called a 17 Enfield, an M17, because it was developed in 1917. It's kind of a clunky gun. It's actually a British P-14, which we were making for England at the time. Well, we had most of our gun equipment tied up making English P-14s. We couldn't make enough Springfields to arm our guys, so we simply switched the two factories over that were making P-14s to making the same gun in 30 6 That became the P-17. Sergeant York did all his good work with that gun. This has a peep sight instead of a, what they call a, <clears throat> this is a tangent sight in the front. The uh, advantage to the peep sight is it's much further back on the gun. Peep sight's back here, tangent sight's up here. The shorter this distance is, the more critical any movement is. You have to line this up very carefully. It's a little bit easier with a peep sight. So, you've got your guns. If you run out of ammunition or things are getting too close, you can go to the bayonet. We're still in 1914 way of thinking. You want to get your bayonet to the enemy before he gets his to yours. You've already got a gun that's as long as a spear. By the time you add something like this, it's pretty unwieldy. Later on, they figured out you didn't do much bayonet work, so the bayonet became more of a utility knife. Uh, incidentally, this is a French bayonet. It has no blade. Strictly a stabbing weapon. Can't do any hacking with it. The Germans <clears throat> tried to get a little more utility out of their bayonet. Not quite as long. This is the bayonet for the German K-98, which was their standard service rifle. Not short like this, it was longer. And this big bayonet, if you notice, has a little bit wider tip than back here at the Ricasso. Reason for that is it puts more weight out in the front. And you can actually use that as a chopping weapon. You notice the, in this particular bayonet, a little more scarce nowadays, it has a saw back on it. That was really made for the engineers and the machine gunners who had to cut down brush to get a clear range of fire. They would use that as a saw. Well, that's not the way the Allies interpreted that. They interpreted that as a sadistic weapon, and if you were caught carrying one of these, you were liable to be treated harshly. So later on, a lot of the German bayonets, you'll find them where they've ground off that part. You'll see a different dimension here because they simply ground off those teeth. Another German-edged weapon was this little thing. This was a German fighting knife, a boot knife. Not much to it, rather cheaply made. But uh, these were issued to the troops, and they carried them wherever they, wherever they could. It has a little belt loop on it, and uh, that was just a, a last-ditch fighting knife. This one here, basically on the same line, this is a theater-made weapon. When we say theater-made, it means it's something they made in the field. This is kind of a trench art knife. These were made, uh, this one probably made at some uh, repair depot or some place that had the ability to cast bronze parts. 
because the blade is made out of a Swedish bayonet. And the handle, while it looks very official with US 1918 on it, this is definitely not an issue knife. This is something they made in the field. It has a spike cast on the back of it, so you can use it as a weapon. And uh, of course the knuckles, and a rather long blade. We did field a trench knife during the war which again, like uh, the hand grenade, didn't really get issued in time. Most of them were used by paratroopers in World War II. But it's a 1918 trench knife, has knuckles on it, has a blade about half as long as this one. Another thing that was actually issued as a potential weapon, not a utility knife like the bolo, this particular bolo was considered a weapon, certainly is, but the uh, the old trench shovel, this is an American knife by the way, the trench shovel is also a weapon. These were very commonly used in close quarters combat. They were so commonly used that even though this is a shovel, they sharpened the outer edges. You can see how they're ground and it was actually used as a chopping weapon rather commonly. Another edged weapon here is a saber. This is a German Blucher. This was a horse artillery saber. Could be used, very seldom was, unless you were on a horse swinging it at somebody, you're more likely to try and stab somebody with it. But it was really kind of a badge of, of rank. A lot of, lot of swords were still carried in World War I, but a lot of them were quite highly decorated officers' swords. I've got one that's the whole blade is acid etched with a cavalry scene on it. Not something they really planned on using. Now, if you're not going to shoot somebody, chances are you'd like to blow them up. <laughs> These are uh, different hand grenades. This one here looks like an American pineapple grenade. It's actually a French grenade. It's a fragmentation grenade, has high explosive in it. The way it works is it has a lever on the back. You hold your thumb over that lever and you pull the ring out that holds the lever in place. Once that pin is pulled, as soon as you let go of the lever, the spring will flip it over and light the fuse. You have about four seconds before it goes off. This French one was used by American troops in World War I. They hardly ever used American grenades because we kept refining the design and refining the design. Finally, the war was over, we never shipped them. And they ended up being used as practice grenades in World War II. Incidentally, they were painted yellow originally. Yellow denoted high explosive. The Japanese, we found, we could see them real easy and they'd throw them back. <laughs> Now, if you count four seconds, there's, there's enough time to do that in a lot of instances. So later we painted them olive drab and we just put a little yellow ring around the top of the grenade and that denoted high explosive. German grenades, they had the stick grenade. You're probably all used to what they called a potato masher. That was a concussion grenade. It had no shrapnel to speak of. It was a lot of explosive in a can. And if you're too near that, the concussion can cause organ damage. A lot of people in World War I died from artillery shock. The concussion of the shell would kill them. They're trying to accelerate somebody backwards with a pressure wave is not good for your insides. The German fragmentation grenade was this little thing called an egg grenade. Very small. The reason for that is you could throw it further. The hand grenade is considered a defensive weapon, not an offensive weapon. The reason being you have to be somewhere hidden when you throw it or you can get hit by the shrapnel. You can't throw it far enough that the shrapnel can't get to you. So it's considered something you would use to keep the Japs away while you're in a trench, not, a, not a offensive. This one could be used in an offensive role because you could actually throw it far enough you were pretty safe. This one here, a little bit different, still got the fragments on it, little fat thing. This is a British Mills bomb. This was a standard British grenade for both World Wars. It didn't change anything much. Worked the same way, pull the pin, let go of the spoon, four seconds and it's gone. 
And this little thing here looks like a bomb. It is a bomb. This is a French pneumatic mortar shell. When you fire a mortar, you use gunpowder to fire it. It makes a lot of noise. Troops know it's coming in. They take cover. This thing was fired with air pressure. Didn't make any noise when you fired it. Four Germans over there trying to get some sleep. You uh, on duty or whatever, you just, hmm, hey, let's wake them up. <laughs> Fire a few of these over there. They don't make any noise coming in. They're also a perfect little aerial bomb. If you were an observation pilot, you're flying over the trenches, people are shooting at you, why not throw something back at them? They could take these up and conveniently drop them. And the last one here, in the grenade business was a rifle grenade. This is a British one, and it's rather unique the way it works. This long rod actually goes into the bore of the gun. And this sits on the end of the rifle. You want to make sure you put a blank cartridge in the rifle before you fire it. Pressure from that blank cartridge shoves that rod out. Uh, basically what they call a spigot mortar. They had large mortars that worked the same way. They had a big rod on the back. One of them's called a plum pudding. It looked like a bowling ball on a stick. And that long stick went into the mortar, and that's what propelled it when they fired it. You could propel a large bomb with a small mortar. Artillery. This little piece here, cute little thing, was used in a British pom-pom gun, which was an anti-aircraft gun, but it was also used in a small piece of artillery that um, it was actually an infantry weapon. It wasn't considered artillery. It had a little set of wheels, looked just like a little cannon, which it was, but you could wheel it up to wherever you were gonna hide. You'd pull the wheels off the carriage and just it laid down, you actually had a telescopic sight on it, and these were really designed for knocking out machine gun nests. Later, when they developed tanks, they came up with a solid bullet. Used the same gun, but it had a solid shot that would punch through the tank. That was called a British one-pounder, and uh, the French actually developed it. That's a French one there. The most commonly used shell during the war, and incidentally, it was an artillery war. Two-thirds of the casualties in that war were caused by artillery. You hear a lot about the machine gun, and it was a wonderful defensive weapon, but for offense, you couldn't beat the artillery. Two-thirds of them were killed with artillery. That's why they developed the helmets. This is a fuse. This is the nose fuse out of a French 75. French 75 was probably the most common artillery used during the war. Germans had a 75 millimeter, everybody did. The way this thing worked, we'll move that for a minute. This is the French 75, assembled around. The shell itself, here's the fuse. It has a time ring on it. And this is very important because you wanted this shell to be coming in on the enemy on an angle it would fire by blowing the end off, and 270 lead balls would come out of the end of that like a cannon. The shell itself does not blow up. The shell stays intact. It's thick enough that the explosive charge in the back of it will propel 270 lead balls downward. Doesn't work to hide in the trench. And the idea was to have that burst 20 feet up or so, and they had a material in there that held the balls together as well as black powder for a charge. Now, black powder is, makes a lot of smoke. It's not smokeless powder. So you get a big puff of smoke. Also, the stuff holding the balls together creates a cloud. And when you look at old World War I movies and you see these puffs of black smoke over the trench, that's these things going off. They were designed not to hit the ground to blow up, but to blow up in the air. So, that cloud of smoke tells the guy firing the gun how far above the ground it's blowing up. If he doesn't see that smoke, he knows he's got a time too long. He'll back off on the time on that fuse. 
If it blows up too high in the air, he'll give it a little more time. So they would set that time ring depending on what they needed. You come up later and take a look at this. This fuse gets blown off the end of that shell. It just it has a separate adapter ring between the brass fuse and the shell with a real fine thread that can easily be blown out. That's what you see here. And inside there are a couple of shrapnel balls that are still attached to the fuse. They're only about half inch, they're lead balls. And the idea of the helmet is not so much to protect against artillery fragments as it is to protect against those lead balls coming in. British helmet, they uh, criticize later for, for not being real good to protect the rest of your head, but if you think about it, this is a wider helmet than the German helmet, and it's better protection actually against those lead balls. German helmet is better protection against artillery fragments. By the way, shrapnel technically are balls that are designed to come out of the shell. What we typically call shrapnel nowadays are artillery fragments. That's what this is. Incidentally, this one I picked up at a gun show. The guy's father sent it back from World War II. When he went through the World War I battlefield, he picked it up and sent it home. He was killed at the end of the war. Last month of the war, he was killed, and his kids sold it for a dollar. Now, the shell, you may have noticed, for the 75, is quite decorated. I don't know if you can see that very well from there, but this is what they call trench art. And this was commonly done in the hospitals while people were convalescing for something to do. They would fill it with wet sand, or sometimes they'd pour it full of lead. That way they could punch these decorations in without deforming the rest of the shell. This is 1918, Metz. And somebody who fought at Metz would buy this probably after the war. A lot of these things were made as souvenirs for the guys to take home after the war. Now, if you're in the trenches, you really don't want to stick your head out of the trench to see what's going on. It's not, not a good idea. Remember, that 30 out 6 will go through 3 quarters of an inch of mild steel. It will certainly go through your helmet. So to protect the guys, that's the way that goes, you got a little periscope. These were issued to our troops when they went overseas. You look through here, you see out here, and this little spike could be used to stick it in the side of the trench and it would just stay there. Anybody walking down the trench could take a look. If you uh, were an officer, you wouldn't want to use a mundane thing like that. You had the officer's periscope, longer distance, also telescopic. So that was the premium periscope. And the enlisted man's was a wooden box with two mirrors in it. But it did the job. In fact, I've got one of these at home. I didn't bring it out because I want to be kind of careful with it. The fellow wrote Argonne Forest on it, and it's got his unit and his name and everything scratched in it with the end of a bullet, probably, in some idle moment. I always wish people would put some information on where those guns had been underneath the butt plate, but I've never found it. This one, evidently, was uh, involved in a BB gun war at some point. There's two BB gun marks in it. <laughs> probably not World War I. Another optical instrument, you got your binoculars. These are German ones. Simple little binoculars, nothing much to them, but they came with a little cover. A little cover was attached to the straps and it stayed on top of them. Because with all this artillery going on, you're constantly getting bombarded with dirt, and that would keep the lenses clean. Now, with all that artillery going on, you got your little helmet to protect you, but you really don't want to be out in the open during an artillery barrage, so you go underground. The only thing you can do 
and you go way underground, 30 feet or better. And if you're down there too long, for too long a bombardment, there's a real good chance you're going to come up crazy. They had a lot of uh, shell shock during the war. But if you're living in a hole in the ground, you're going to need some light. They used a lot of miner's lamps. I've got a German miner's lamp that's a dead copy of a French one. They just happened to like it. And uh, just like the Bergman here, it was a copy of a French lamp. And uh, it's got German writing on it, though, so we know it was German lamp. This one here is kind of a cross between uh, expedience and trench art. This lamp was made, it's a carb it's made out of an artillery shell. The bottom of it is an artillery shell. The top is probably artillery shell brass. And uh, the way these work, they have calcium carbide in the top part of the lamp. No, in the bottom, excuse me. Calcium carbide in the bottom, water in the top. You fill it through this little hole, and you have a little valve here that regulates the rate at which that water drips onto that carbide. Mix water with a carbide, you get acetylene gas that comes out the top, and that was your flame. Acetylene burns very brightly. It's what's used in miners' lamps, or used to be. They're all electric now, I think. But that was a homemade trench lamp. Ah, let's see. Another thing, Germany was having a lot of trouble financing the war. And these two medals here are what they call sacrifice medal. If you contributed your gold or silver jewelry to the war effort, you were given one of these medals. And uh, the one on your left here has got a, a bezel around it that was evidently made for people to wear that medal in lieu of their jewelry. Another thing here, we've got early dog tags, rather primitive for the Americans. They were just an aluminum disc that were hand stamped. The top one is a German dog tag, and that had all the German soldiers' information on it, and it was perforated along the middle. So if he were shot, they could break that in half, leaving the information on the body and the other half of it goes to records. That's why in World War II we carried two dog tags. One stayed with the corpse. And uh, did we cover the barbed wire? <clears throat> A lot of barbed wire was used during the war. And in order to avoid getting shot when you're out there putting the barbed wire up, they developed this nifty little fence post. I bought this out in... Uh, Let's see, I was in, uh, oh, God, somewhere out west. Don't remember where we were? Hmm? No, 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 no. What state? Yeah. At any rate, out west they call it a cavalry fence post because the cavalry used them for putting up temporary stockades for the horses. But it was a World War I item. This one was made for World War I, it takes four rows of barbed wire, and you could screw it into the ground. You're out there in the middle of the night trying to repair the fence wire. You don't want to make any noise, because if you do, somebody's going to take this little flare gun, and they're going to put up a flare, and it's going to light everything up, and you're going to be machine gun target. So they came up with this nifty idea, you put a rod through here and you screw it into the ground and then you can just kind of hook your barbed wire into it. And that became the fence post. I think we were in Wyoming when we found that. That's where they used that as a cavalry post. Another piece I just picked up the other day, this is an old Model 1909 horse bit. A lot of horses went down during the war. There's a good movie called War Horse, if you see that. Uh, that horse got lucky and came back. Most of them did not. This one's a little bent up and very rusted. This was picked up in probably at least 50 years after the war, by the looks of a pity. Now, 
souvenirs that were made during the war. This is kind of a neat little piece, looks like a little officer's hat. This is again made out of an artillery shell, the base of a French 75. Little button decoration for the front, a little strip riveted on, and they just took part of the shell and bent it out for the visor. Makes a convincing little hat. Another item that was made out of leftovers. This is a piece of artillery shell fragment that was forged by a blacksmith into a letter opener, leaving the rough fragment on the back for a handle and even a little bit of the driving band of the shell for decoration. Letter openers were a popular souvenir. This is a bust of von Hindenburg. Germans had their souvenirs too. Von Hindenburg was very famous and uh, he got a lot of notoriety. They sold thousands of souvenirs to the Germans of him. And here's another one. This one right here is a, a bookend. It was sold after the war. The base of the bookend has a trench running through it and a British tank. The American souvenir was uh, good old John J. Pershing. And uh, it was called Blackjack Pershing during the war because he was in charge of colored troops. They'll give you different stories on that, but that's what it was. <laughs> Nice old picture frame here. This is a, one of the patriotic frames. I got two of these, uh, they're both different. They have the flags and guns and swords and stuff on them typically. You buy that to put your son's picture in. And uh, another one here is the uh, commemorative medal coined by Belgium. Belgium got uh, pretty badly treated by the Germans early in the war, but they finally held them off at the West End. And uh, the Germans never completely took Belgium. That's what this commemorates. The French and the British came in to reinforce them. It was their treatment of Belgium, really, which was what brought the British into the war. And the whistle, well, we covered that. Standard whistle. This one happens to be an original brought back by a, a veteran of World War I. And God knows how many people that sent over the top. But that would be their signal whistle. The other signal commonly used was the flare gun. This is a French one. Simple little thing. Unlocks. Breaks open. Put a shell in like a shotgun. Cocked. And fired in the air. If you were out repairing fences, you wouldn't want anybody using one of them. And this here is a British entrenching tool. It was at the World War I Museum a few years back. Beautiful museum, by the way. Very nice. A lot of stuff in there. Artillery tanks. They got everything, I thought. I found my German wire cutters in there. I couldn't find any entrenching tools. And I finally got the curator and I asked him, Where, where's your entrenching tools? They didn't have any. This is the trench war. And they didn't have a single entrenching tool. I hope they've remedied that by now. And I don't know whether I brought this up or not, but this is a German wire cutter. Now one thing you notice about these that's a little different than any other wire cutter you probably ever saw is this big duck bill on the front of it. The reason for that is if you're out at night repairing wire, and somebody's liable to be shooting at you, you're likely to be a little nervous. That was an easy way to find that wire. The wire would funnel into the jaws so you could cut it. This one happens to be a German set. And by the way, the museum did have a German set, so I was able to identify that. And I think that just about covers it. Hmm? Oh, didn't we cover this? Okay, well, we better cover this. This is a German Lanchester submachine gun, actually a British Lanchester. This was a copy of the German Bergman, what they call the MP18, MP being machine pistol and 18 being the year it was developed. It looks exactly like the German one. That's why I brought it out, but the magazine is different. On this gun, magazine comes in 
perpendicular to the gun. German when the magazine comes in on a 45 because they used an experimental Luger magazine with a high capacity. It was actually a drum magazine, funny looking thing. But it clipped in on about a 45 degree angle. And this was a, an effective, probably the first effective submachine gun used. We had the Thompson, but we hadn't really developed it and got it into service. These were in service in 1918 by the Germans. The reason this one has some Arabic markings on it is when the British sold ships, this was used by the Navy, by the way, and when they sold a ship, they sold everything with it. And all the guns that were on the ship went with the ship. So uh, that one probably went to some Middle Eastern country by the looks of it. Okay. Hmm? Which? Oh, the Shell Girls? I, I don't know. I guess we didn't cover that. I was talking to other people about it. Picture of British women working in the munitions plants. Just like us in World War II, they pressed the girls into service. And uh, almost all the workers in the munitions plants, as well as a lot of gun manufacturing and that sort of thing, was done by women. They say their hair turned a <laughs> kind of a blonde because of the acids and the high explosives they were working with. The barbed wire. And the barbed wire, these are different types of wire. Okay, and they had quite a few. Every country probably had their own. It's amazing how many different kinds of barbed wire there were. I was out west uh, this year and we stopped at a museum of barbed wire of all things. And there must be hundreds of different types. It's hard to imagine how they could invent that many different things. This one here is more or less a ribbon with spikes on it. It would be very hard to cut with a wire cutter. You'd need a, a shearing action rather than a pinching action to cut it. Same thing with this one up here. So I think that about wraps it up. Any questions? We do have a poster, that's right. Brought the poster in. Posters, you know, we didn't have television at the time, so posters were real important. I've got a book on these things, and there were probably several hundred different posters made up. And that's uh, how you recruited, that's how you got donations, all of that. And they ran all through the war. It's a very nice poster, by the way. So have we uh, have we done it? What does WSS stand for? WFF. War Savings. Oh, stand. yeah. War Savings. Is that what it is? Yeah, good for you. Okay, there it is. Yeah, this this is that's your poster. Very good. <laughs> well, I have a yes. Uh, it would, yeah. Well, if you had if you had a proper flare, yeah, yep. And that uh, I think I mentioned that is a French one, but somebody brought it home as a souvenir. It's got 1914, 1918 stamped on it. So evidently that one did go to war. The mortars that they used were they spring loaded for the time, or were they rifles? Uh, so, so many revolutions. Oh, the, on the mortars. Well, they had uh, usually just a percussion fuse. But uh, some of the German ones, I don't know whether any of the American ones were rifled, but there, there were a lot of big mortars that were actually rifled. You had to fit the shell into the rifling and drop it in. The big, what they call uh, Minenwerfers, German mortars were typically that way. This thing I think I showed you is the base of a German mortar. They also used mortars as a way of communication. I ran into a guy a couple of years ago at a gun show, had an interesting looking German mortar shell with the same type of base, and uh, did some research on it. I caught, caught him later on at a different show, and he said that that was a message shell. They'd write out the message, they'd screw it into the shell, and they had that mortar, uh, they would probably fire it into the area they wanted to communicate with, and wherever it hit, they probably put a circle around it, and they knew they could hit within that circle, and anything coming in to that circle 
was likely a message. And they could, they could communicate down the line quite a ways by firing these mortars with a written note inside. Are there any other questions for Jim? What were the calibers of those rifles and that pistol? Uh, the pistol <clears throat> is rather large because it was a black powder. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 calibers. It was also a rather weak thing because it was black powder. It's not a very big shell. I don't think you'd want to get hit with it, but uh, not powerful by today's standards. This one ended up, this started out as a 10.4 caliber black powder, very large bore. But they had to convert it to a 6.5. This is a, a rather small <coughs> bullet. And what they did is they bored it out and they put an actual sleeve inside of it and rifled and bored that for the 6.5, making it a very heavy gun. But that's the smallest caliber used that I know of, 6.5. Actually, you can see that the 30 caliber, about the same size clip, they actually got an extra shell in there. That's six rounds, this is five. This is 30 caliber, that's the uh, Springfield, or the uh, Enfield, and the British Enfield was a 303. And, uh, what was the French? I think, I think the French were more closer to an eight. So that was probably about an eight millimeter on that French one. Don't quote me on that. Anything else? Um, does that still work, the long one? If it was this shot, one here? If it was shot, would it still work? Well, you'd have to fill the fuse with powder. And the shell, of course, is empty and the casing is empty, and the fuse has been used. So that's pretty that well out of service. For, um, this um, little one here? That hmm? one would be great for messages, so that Well, no, these are too high speed. A mortar is, is a real low speed thing, okay? It just lobs the shell. And these fire the shell out at pretty good velocity. It's a much longer range. It would be hard to, to pinpoint where it's going to land. But with the mortar, wouldn't it blow up the message? No. No, the shell, the shell comes out intact. The message would simply be inside. You could unscrew the front of it, pull the message out. No problem. They made a couple that were only for messages. Now. Yeah, they had a, Germans anyhow had a special shell that was made for communication. Yeah. It still fired like a regular shell, but it didn't blow up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of like this clever little French pneumatic thing. It didn't make any noise when you fired it. Is it okay if they come up and look at oh, this a little yeah. bit closer? Sure. Why don't we give Jim a round of applause and thank him for coming.